Yes, I guess what we're going to be talking about today is a new book, your new book. Yep. Okay, Good. none of us have had a chance to read it, but we have to remember we're going back to the 1960s here. I mean, there's a <laughs> lot of lost technology, and I was thinking about the 1960s when you had platform shoes, bell-bottom pants, love beads, and flower power. And the one thing we lost for sure from the 1960s is flower power. Apollo lost a lot more power, apparently, but you're going to tell us all about that. Yeah, that's another story for today, actually. First of all, hello to Marcus, to Robert, as, as well as you, Scott. It's been a while because we decided, uh, I wanted. I threw myself into the book. I wanted to get this book done because it's been, you know, two and a half, what, three years since I put out a book on the Apollo moon hoax. So let me explain how this particular project came about because there's, it's an interesting story behind it. So when I put out my first book back in 2018, I got my first big break besides my mention in Nexus magazine, which really helped the book. I also got a review from a top Amazon 500 reviewer. And that really helps push the book. When you get a rating from a top Amazon 500 reviewer, that really, really helps. So I just happened to be part of an email group at that time. And I mentioned the review and somebody in the group says, oh, I know her. Her name is Robin. And I said, well, can you thank her for the review? And if possible, can you put me in contact with her? And he did. So we started, you know, just emailing each other back and forth. And then I put out my second book back in 2021. And she gave me another really good review. And of course, Nexus, I was fortunate enough to have Nexus also review the book. So that really helped as well. And so things were going really well. And so then we started developing an online sort of relationship and it developed into a friendship. I actually had introduced Marcus to her several months ago. We did a video together yeah. and she approached me about a year ago and asked me if I would be interested in writing a fictional book on the Apollo moon mission hoax. And I said, well, you know, I don't know about that. It's hard enough writing a nonfiction book. And I've gotten so used to that because, you know, there's no characters involved. You're not developing characters and a lot more skill when it comes into writing a fiction book. So I said to her, I said, well, let me think about it. It's an intriguing idea. And let me think about it. So what I did was I ordered one of her books. She's written several books and she's also an accomplished musician too, very talented. So I read one of her books. It was actually designed for... 14 year olds to 18 year olds. It was a conspiracy book, interesting enough, but geared towards that young age group. So not really my cup of tea, but nonetheless, I read the book and actually enjoyed it. I think more so because I liked her writing style. So I said to her, I said, okay, but I don't have any experience writing fiction. So you're going to have to really help me with this. And even not knowing how to write fiction, I can tell that there's quite amount of skill involved. So she came up with the idea that, okay, so why don't we write the book? She'll write the narrative. And then the narrative is written around a journal that the astronaut, the first man to walk on the moon left after he died. And before he died, he said, you have to read my journal. You have to find my journal and read it. None of it happened. And that's how the book starts. None of it happens. So the grandson, he's on a hunt to find this journal. He thought his grandfather, you know, when his grandfather, the astronaut, when he died, he was just hallucinating. But he actually took him seriously with the journal part. He said, I have to find this journal. And he does. And the story goes from there. Now, I sent a first draft to Marcus and I got some really good feedback on the draft. And it was a little bit geared too much to young people. And I agreed. I needed to talk to Robert and get the maturity level of that book up to where we are. So we got the maturity level up, the age level up. So the youngest person, the grandson is 24 years old. He's the youngest person in the book. The rest are, you know, involved adults, military generals, some very nefarious characters. And that's how it's structured around the journal. And the journal is interspersed throughout the book. They find a journal and they start reading it. But while they're reading it, 
they're being chased and they're being hunted down because this journal is a threat to some very powerful forces in the world who control the world. And if this journal gets out, it's going to start a domino effect and in terms of destroying their power base. So we go from 1969, from the first landing on the moon, up to present day, up to 2022, 2023. So we have a lot, how shall I say it, a lot of rabbit holes to go down. I actually wrote the journal part. Robin wrote the narrative around the journal. And so every time you see a chapter with a journal, that's me. And I had to develop a dialogue in a journal between two characters, a, a mysterious character who you'll find out in the book, and of course, the astronaut, the first astronaut to land on the moon, which I called Andrew McNear. Actually, Robin gave him that name. We use fictitious names. I started off writing the real names, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, you know, so on and so forth. We got some advice and because of some possible legal ramifications of doing that, because it is a fiction book, we decided to change the names. We kept the Apollo missions. We kept because historical figures like President the Kennedy because he Freeman was the one who launched this whole program. So we kept that because I have read books, actually fictional accounts of President Kennedy. So it's okay to keep the historical figures in there. But we didn't want to get into some, you know, legal murky ground here in terms of any, you know, conflict. So we changed the names, but we used everything else as the same, like Apollo 11, all the Apollo missions. So people will know that we're talking about. I decided to keep NASA in there, to keep the name Apollo missions in there. Pure fiction then. It is pure fiction. You're using Apollo, that's pure fiction. That's, that's, NASA has been true. writing fiction for how long now? Yeah, well, that's true. The great so. thing about this is though, with writing fiction, we actually, of course, it's based on everything I've written in my first two books. So it's fiction based on truth. And that's how we're kind of selling it. And the great thing about writing fiction is, is that it gives you a lot of latitude to explore things that you normally couldn't in a nonfiction book because people are going to say, well, we want sources. But this gave us a lot of latitude to use some speculation. So I got into the real meat. I not only talk about the missions being faked, I write about how they were faked and the impact that it had on the first man to land on the moon and the impact that it had on his family and the impact that it had and the reasons why it was faked or some of the reasons why it was faked, which leads down into some other rabbit holes. So we get into everything in this book. We get into the Kennedy assassination. We get into the conspiracy with the music industry, everything. And so what we did was, is we left the book open at the end because we are leaning out towards writing a part two. So that's basically the nexus of how it all started. When you were talking there, it was reminding me, uh, we did a little bit of a video on first the 1962 movie, First Men in the Moon. The movie goes back in time in British history when they actually left the documents on the moon. If you recall that the um, graphics were very well done in that movie. Yeah, but I haven't seen that, but I know of it. You know, it's very interesting. When I was writing the book, it's just halfway through writing it, and it went through a couple of rewrites, you know, because we needed to get some other things going and get it right. But it enabled me to put my mind in the character of Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk in the moon, supposedly, right? And it really gave me a chance to sort of maybe pontificate about maybe what he was going through. He's demonized by us sometimes, and I'm thinking that, Maybe he was forced into it. I know, Marcus, you've alluded to this yourself several times, how maybe he was inadvertently forced into it. He got himself into a situation. He realized he was too deep. He couldn't get out of it. He saw what was happening around him. He saw what happened to the Apollo 1 crew. He saw what happened to Thomas Barron and his wife when he dared to come forward and talk about the poor quality control going on in the NASA program. He saw what happened to him to them. And I'm wondering if his own mind, he got really scared and tried to find a way out. But instead of being able to find a way out, he found an ally. And that's where the book comes in. That's what happens in the journal is he finds an ally. And this ally is a very powerful force himself. And he helps to guide him through this. So up until the end of part one, it's loosely based on his story with a lot with speculation on my part then in part two we're going to continue but we're going to go in a slightly different direction but it really made me think some of the astronauts loved it because they were getting this fame and fortune 
But there might have been one or two, maybe I'll use the character in the book, Andrew McNair, maybe one of them. He was starting to feel a little bit pressured. He was worried that this could destroy his family. He's living a lie. And it really takes off from there. And the book has several layers in it that it shows the struggles that he's going through because he knows he's participating in one of the greatest hoax of all time. And he has no choice. He's locked in. Basically, he's a victim of circumstance. Yeah. It's a life-altering situation. It's not temporary. It's the rest of his life. And that's the sad part about this. It's almost like a Shakespearean tragedy in the sense that he gets himself into this situation and he's all gone home at first, right? And, you know, he joins the Air Force and then he joins the X-15 program and he proves himself there and he flies on Gemini. And it's during the Gemini, and I wrote this in my part of the story, it's during the Gemini program that he starts getting a little bit suspicious about things. Like he starts going, well, you know, what's going on there? What really happened with the first manned Gemini program, that, which was actually with Gus Grissom? What actually happened with his mishap when he splashed down? He starts looking into that. He starts to connect with the character. I named the character Dave in the book. It's closely modeled after Gus Grissom and I name him Dave Young in the book and he develops a relationship with Dave and he finds out that Dave is kind of thinking the same thing he is and by this time they're in the Apollo program and it's in that they start to realize that things are not going right here things are not going according to plan maybe there's something else going on here and you start to notice that the technology is constantly breaking down. It's not performing the way NASA is selling it to the public. And even they themselves are kept in the dark until the very last minute when there's a top security level meeting that NASA calls and then they inform all the astronauts what's really going on and it goes from there. It sounds a very good synopsis of the book in how people who are like, let's call him his real name, Armstrong was a very, very good pilot. He was a test pilot. And he was very good. And he did save, was it Gemini 8? I think it was. Uh, they started the spinning and he was yeah. able to control it and get the craft back. Gus Grissom's, it was his Mercury flight, which he crashed, yes. not the Gemini flight, because Gus That's Grissom Gemini. didn't fly on the Gemini flights. So I think what you're doing is introducing a very good idea that an honourable man, and Armstrong was an honourable man, was trapped in circumstances he couldn't control and he just had to go along with it and he didn't want to go along with it. There's the famous mission on Apollo 11. Armstrong's photograph does not appear, certainly not recognizably as such. And it took many, many years for somebody to come up with the idea that he was photographed in one of the panoramas and we see his back view. That's the only time we see it. So he was not cooperating as you would expect somebody to do given that he was a senior NASA astronaut at the time. He was invited to join the Apollo program. He didn't apply himself, but having got into it, he couldn't get out of it, which I think is also part of the reason that his burial at sea has not really been commented on. When Armstrong died after an operation, didn't go according to plan in 2012, yeah. he died. And he'd requested a burial at sea. Now, people tried to excuse this by saying, well, he was a naval pilot, which he was. So he could have yeah. legitimately asked for a, a burial at sea. But if he really wanted to be memorialized as the first man on the moon, which is what he was always promoted as, why would he choose to be buried at sea? It makes no sense. Gus Grissom is actually buried at Arlington National Cemetery, but Armstrong isn't. And then you have the very sad decline of Buzz Aldrin through alcoholism, through divorces. He was not behaving very well. And I think Bart Sibrell's confrontation with him, which resulted in the punch that went around the world, I think that was a giveaway from Aldrin as not being able to confront what he had to deal with in the same way that Armstrong had dealt with it. And when you see the confrontation between Neil Armstrong and Bart Sibrell, where Neil Armstrong quite politely but very definitely declines to put his hand on a Bible to swear he'd walked on the moon. Yeah. This is not the behavior of somebody who is trying to maintain a fiction. It's the behavior of an honorable man who is trying to maintain his dignity. That's a very good point. And just to back up with something you said there earlier, 
I actually did put that in the book, how the character in the book, Andrew McNear, tries to avoid any direct photos of himself on the fake moon set. And he goes in to explain, he says, I don't think it's going to do much good, but at least I can keep my face out of it. Of course, they're going to see me in the command module and the lunar module, but it's just this my small way of sort of saying that, hey, I don't endorse this. Yeah. And it was through subtle ways, as you so eloquently put, Marcus, it was through subtle ways that he was hinting and hoping that people in the future will look back and see that, you know, he was trying in his own way to get some signals that this was not, the all was not right with the Apollo program. I think all of you will end up liking the character, the lead character, not the lead character in Robin's journal. You'll like her a lot. There's three lead characters, actually. There's Robbins developed two characters in the book. One is a skeptic who starts to find out about the book, and she teams up with the grandson about the journal. And the other one is from a very powerful family, and she's a villain. And you always have to have a villain in a fiction story because it really gives it some spice, right? And this villain is quite the villain as uh, Robin develops the character. And then there's the other lead character, and that's Andrew McNair. And I think you will like the character Andrew McNair, the first man to walk in the room, because he battles with his conscience a lot. He goes through a lot of changes and starts looking for simplicity in life. He doesn't like what he's gotten himself into, but he's trapped at the same time because he doesn't want to put his family and or his friends in harm's way. And he knows that he has responsibility to them as well. And he knows he's lying to the world, but he has to find another way to do it. And the whole idea of him being contacted by a mysterious stranger, because he sees and he has connections through NASA and he sees what's going on. And they reach out to the first man to walk in the moon, Andrew. They reach out to him, they connect with him. And they say, look, basically, we know what you're going through. You're not going to be able to get out of this. It's too dangerous. But we can help you and we can guide you. We can offer you some protection. And that's where I took his story and mixed in with that, how they fake the Apollo missions and with areas that I wasn't too sure about. I actually said that there was one conversation between the mysterious stranger and Andrew. And he's saying, well, how, how is how's NASA going to fake this? How are they going to convince the world? How are they going to convince the mission controllers that this whole thing is fake? I mean, there's too many people to involve here. How? And he goes through and he explains methodically how he's going to fool the mission controllers, how he's going to fool the public, how the media has been bought anyway, so they can control the narrative through the media and any other areas that he couldn't explain. He says, remember this. The military is in full control of the Apollo missions, and they have technologies that decades ahead of any given time in history. So we don't know what they're really capable of doing, but we do know that they have technology. We have access to some of that technology, but they have technology that's far more advanced than the average person knows at the present time. So they'll be using that to help put forward the fake narrative and convince the public and the world that they landed on the moon. So it gets into all of that. Is the stranger who helps McNair, is he based on any real person or is it somebody you've imagined? I created that person. I started writing the journal separate. Robin had sent me several drafts and I looked at the drafts. I really liked it, but I said, we need to bring it up a bit. We need to bring this up to a mature audience. Uh, we need to get it into the adult sphere, right? And so I had to find a way to start off the narrative. And what I did was, is I developed the other mysterious character. I give him a name, which you'll see in the book. He's actually been part of what I label a collective. And they have been actually aware of what's going on about a decade before the Apollo missions were even discussed. So he, he was involved in countering some nefarious activities that he saw happening in the United States in the early 1950s and that he was starting to get involved in a lot of this. And of course, when he saw the Apollo program, he knew right away, the collective knew right away that this was a psyops. And so they had actually reached out to Dave Young. Dave Young is the character I modeled after Gus Grissom, but that didn't go well for Dave Young. And then they reached out to and connected with 
Andrew McNair, who, of course, I modeled after Neil Armstrong. And so that relationship really flourishes between the mysterious stranger and Andrew, and he helps get him through the Apollo program. I thought it was a very poignant scene in the journal when at the end, and Andrew says, the mysterious stranger says, you've convinced the world. Everyone thinks you've landed on the moon. Introspection when he says, you mean I lied to the world? You mean I participated in the greatest hoax on mankind? That's what you're really saying to me. And the mysterious stranger says to him, he says, I know this is not easy for you, but as I said to you before, this is going to come out. This is why we've connected with you. We connected with you because we're going to help you get this out. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen tomorrow. So he says, I have to live with this life for the next several years, next several decades. He says, possibly. He says, well, that's easy for you to say. I'm the one who participated and I'm the one to put my face out there. And this goes back and forth. And he eventually convinces Andrew that what you're doing is noble. You're going to be part of revealing this to the public. That day will come. And that's how he helps him get through this, right? I hope that I wrote some layers with substance to these characters. There's some other characters in the journal too, but those are the two main characters. I really do hope I've done it some justice. I look forward to all of your feedback. 